in just a little bit, probably about halfway through the message, we're going to be looking at the book of Daniel. So Daniel chapter 7. So if you want to get a head start, I know when you're going from the New Testament all the way into the Old Testament, uh, specifically into a little book by the, like Daniel, might take you a minute to find it. Revelation in chapter 13, this is now the 16th message uh, that we've brought in our series and our study through the book of Revelation. And uh, I don't know about you, but I thoroughly have enjoyed it. It's been, in a, uh, it's been a study that has uh, certainly helped me to grow in my knowledge of the Scriptures, my confidence in my Savior, and my understanding of the things that are to come. So Revelation chapter 13, tonight the message is going to be, now we've been in in Revelation 12 and we were looking at seven visions of all. Some of them were wonderful, some of them were awful, uh, and this is the sixth vision that John sees, or the sixth person or personality, and this we see uh, is the rise of the Antichrist during the period of the tribulation. Notice what the Bible has to say here, and I stood... Revelation 13, 1, and I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. Look at verse 2. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of the, a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon which gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast saying, Who is like unto the beast and who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. We've noted several times that's the duration of the second half of the tribulation. In verse 6, and he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. If you remember back in chapter 12, the devil and his followers were kicked out of heaven. And the devil is ticked off about that and has a lot of bad things to say. Verse 7, And it was given unto him to make war with the saints. Those are the, those are the Christians and the people in the time of the tribulation that have come to faith in Christ, and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him who ne whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If any man have an ear, let him hear. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. And he that killeth with a sword must be killed with a sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. In chapter 13 of Revelation, verses 1 through 10, we have the description of the rise of of the Antichrist. Let's pray. Let's jump into our Bible study tonight. Father, we thank you for this evening. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this portion of Scripture. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that, uh, Lord, that you pull aside the uh, veil of prophecy, and Lord, you let us look into the things that are to come. And Father, that you, re uh, Lord, you hide nothing from us, but God, you re reveal all that is pertinent to us during this age, and Lord, that which leads up to that age. And Father, we thank you, Lord, that we ask uh, you've given us this, these things, and God help us to understand them. Lord, we thank you in Jesus' name, and amen. Now, we won't take a long time tonight, uh, but just simply by way of a quick review as we're looking at the seven visions. Well, in chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, we saw the vision of the woman, and we come to find out that represents Israel. That's the nation of Israel. In the second thing, in chapter 12 and verse 3, we saw the great red dragon and found that that was the devil, Satan and Lucifer, the fallen cherub. The third vision was in chapter 12 and verse 5. It was the man-child. This is Christ. This is the Savior, uh, the uh, Savior of the world. Uh, in uh, chapter 12 and verses 7 through 9, we saw the fourth wonder. That was the war in heaven. How that Michael and his angels fought against uh, Satan and his angels and the devil was banished and kicked out of heaven. 
And then uh, the fifth wonder we saw at the latter part of chapter 12 was the overcomers. These were the men and women, just ordinary mere people like me and you, who during the time of the tribulation come to faith in Christ and through the blood of the Lamb and through uh, the word of their testimony and loving not their lives unto the death, they overcame the most powerful being apart from God himself. Now, that brings us up to chapter 13 and verse 1. We see the rise of the Antichrist, the sixth amazing sight that the Apostle John, John sees in this portion. Now, I want you to get the picture. The Apostle John, he's, he's marooned on the Isle of Patmos. So over uh, what we would call modern-day Turkey, there's a small island off what would be uh, the old city of Ephesus, and it was the island of Patmos. If you were condemned by the Roman government and e- exiled to banishment, this little barren piece of rock is where they would, uh, they would take you out by boat, they would kick you off, and they would just assume you're going to starve to death, you're going to uh, faint from lack of fresh water, supplies, anything, and uh, you would soon perish. But you know, it's interesting, when you're in the palm of God's hand and you're in the center of God's will, no matter whether you're here or whether you're there, my friend, you're in the safest place possible. And God uh, did preserve the Apostle John. In fact, he went out there and got a position and a place and a purpose for him to be on that Isle of Patmos because that is where he received the revelation of the book of Revelation. It's interesting. You know that God can even work through the most wor- uh, worst circumstances of your lives to bring about some of the greatest results to his glory and our good. Now, I want you to picture this. John is on this desert island. He's on the sand of the sea. Can you just picture his sand, his toes are in the sand, and, he, and the blazing Mediterranean sun is overhead, and the blue waters of the expanse of the uh, Mediterranean, Mediterranean Ocean is uh, before him. And, and out of the waters he sees, notice here in chapter 13 and verse 1, and I stood upon the sand of the sea, and a beast rise up, and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. And upon his horns, uh, ten crowns, and upon his heads, the names of blasphemy. John is beholding, and he sees this, uh, this awful, amazing sight. And this is the sight of the uh, embodiment of the Antichrist. Now, what's first, uh, the Bible gives us his description. The first of all, his name or description, he's described as a beast. This is a horrific, unearthly, supernatural creature. The word beast that is used here is for a wild, deranged hunting animal. It is an animal that is a sole purpose is to hunt and to kill and to destroy. Now, please remember that the devil is out to imitate and try to replicate all that is God without being God. The devil wants to be God. He wants to be God the Father. And so God the Father, the real God the Father, sent God the Son to represent Him, the earthly, physical incarnation. That is Christ. And so what we see here is the devil's anti-Christ or imitation Christ. Here in chapter 13, the first very part of it. Now, his description we have here is that he has seven heads and ten horns and ten crowns upon his horns. Now, you may think to yourself, now that sounds vaguely familiar. Well, hold your place here and go back with me to Revelation chapter 12 and verse 3. Notice the similarity in verse chapter 12 and verse 3 of the great red dragon. And there appeared another wonder in heaven. And behold, a great red dragon having, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his head. So we see the embodiment of the living devil in this anti-Christ. Slight difference here because we notice they both have seven heads. We notice they both have ten horns, but they have uh, a differing number of crowns. The devil has a crown on on each of his head, and the anti-Christ has uh, ten horns and a crown on each of the horns. Now you say, well now, What's the difference there? Well, if you hold your place here, and back in Revelation 13, those horns are symbolic. Go with me, turn over to chapter 17. Revelation in chapter 17. And I want to pick up our reading down in verse 9. In Revelation chapter 17, we have here, again, another vision and a a vision of that. Uh, Back up to verse 8 for a little bit of Con, verse 7 for context. And the angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou, didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carried her, which hath the seven heads and ten horns. So we have a picture here of the same image. 
the beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. Now that word perdition means destruction. It means to be cast into the eternal lake of fire under the judgment of God. And they that dwell upon the earth shall wonder, we read about that in chapter 13, whose names are not written in the book of life and the foundation of the world, when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is, and we'll learn a little bit more about that in a moment, what that phrase is talking about. Here is the mind that hath wisdom. Notice here, the seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. Now, much has been made about those seven mountains, whether those are geographic mountains, whether those are physical mountains. Some have pointed to the seven hills of Rome, the seven geographical mountains that uh, support the, or surround the city of Rome. Others have pointed to the fact that these mountains represent kingdoms and authorities around the world. Notice in verse 10, there are seven kings. So, these seven heads represent kings. Five are fallen, and one is, and the other is not yet come. That is the rise of the Antichrist. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. It's 42 months. Now, verse 11, and the beast that was and is not, even he is of the eighth and is of the seventh and goeth into perdition. Now, the Bible explains in verse 12 these horns and also the crowns. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. And these have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. And then we'll pause our reading there. And so back to chapter 13 and verse 1 and 2. So we see the description. We see this beast, this unearthly unnatural creature with seven heads. These seven heads represent kingdoms and kings. These horns also represent kingdoms that, and kings that will be confederate and crowns as well that represent kingdoms that will, and kings that will rule in authority with the Antichrist. Now notice here as we continue in verse 2. And the beast which I saw, what is the, so we saw his heads and what's on his heads, that was the most prominent, but in verse 2, then he moves on, he begins to describe the physical body. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard. Now, I want you to pay uh, particular attention to the particular animals and the order of the animals, because it's significant. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, signifying speed. And his feet were as the feet of a bear, signifying power. And his mouth was as the mouth of a lion, signifying destruction. And the dragon gave him his power and his seed and his great authority. And so we see a physical description of the Antichrist here. Now, I want you to notice with me, and I'm looking in my notes uh, where, where this happens to be. Um, I think I need to move on down here. Ah, here we go. All right. We notice here that uh, his, the shape of his body is of a leopard. His feet were as the feet of a bear, and he had the mouth of a lion, a roaring lion. It's interesting, the verse that comes to mind is 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8, where the Bible says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walking uh, as a devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Now, I want you to hold your hand here, and again, keep in mind that order, a leopard, a bear, and a lion. Hold your hand here in Revelation chapter 13. Go back with me to Daniel chapter 7, Daniel chapter 7. Daniel, uh, the book of Daniel, specifically the middle part of the book of Daniel, is a direct prophetic correlation to this part of the middle of the book of Revelation. Same visions, two different times, describing the end times. Now, in Daniel 7, we find an interesting cross-reference to this passage. We noted the order, a leopard, a bear, and a lion. Now, in Daniel, starting in verse 1, we see this. In the first year, of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and the visions of his head upon his bed. And he wrote the dream and told the sum of the matters. And Daniel speak and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of the heavens strove upon the great sea. Notice the sea. In the Bible, many times the sea represents humanity. The group of all the population of the world together. Notice that he saw the, uh, well, the heavens or the winds of heaven striving upon the sea. 
If you'll remember back in Revelation 13, John sees the beast come up out of the sea. Now, in verse 3, and four great beasts came up from the sea, divers one from another. Notice the order. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. And I beheld to the wings thereof were plucked, and it was lifted up uh, from the earth and made to stand upon the feet as a man, and a man's heart was given to it. Now, prophetically and historically, we understand that to be Babylon. That was the uh, representation of King Nebuchadnezzar. God said unto him, number, not only are you the head of gold, but Nebuchadnezzar, you were the king of kings, representing the excellency of power and order in, in, in a kingdom. So we see a lion. Number two in verse five. And behold, another beast, a second, like unto a bear. And it raised itself up on one side, and it had three ribs in the mouth of it, between the teeth of it. And uh, they said unto it, Arise, devour much flesh. A bear, a bear is known for his mauling power. This was the uh, Medo-Persian Empire. Right after the, uh, uh, the empire, the Babylonian empire, fell to the Persians. The Persians, what we would call modern-day Iraq and Iran, and they were known for their dis- brute force destruction. But the image of that kingdom is of a bear. Now notice in verse 6, and after this I beheld in lo, another like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl, and the beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. Now, in prophetic history, this is, we understand this to be Alexander the Great and the Greek, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the Greek Empire. Alexander represented the leopard. There was no uh, conqueror in history that conquered more land quick, more quickly uh, than Alexander the Great. And at the demise of Alexander the Great, four of his generals, were the, his kingdom was divided into four parts by four different generals. These are the four heads of the leopard. Now, notice in the uh, visions to Daniel from God, it was a lion, then it was a bear, then it was a leopard. It's always interesting, the devil tries to imitate and replicate what God has already done. But yet the devil never gets the order right. The devil has, uh, has the order exactly backwards. And may I say that's exactly the devil's plan. God, the devil always wants to take God's proper order and flip it upside down. God wants to be the head. God wants uh, to have Christ as our Savior. God wants Christ to be in our hearts and serve him. God wants us to put that upside down. God, the devil wants you to be in charge and Christ to be your servant and God to be absolutely last. The devil tries to flip the home upside down. The devil tries to flip society upside down. The devil tries to flip morals upside down. The devil tries to flip history upside down. Everything that God does, the devil tries to imitate and replicate, but he always does it backwards from God. So it's very interesting. The devil, what he's trying to do in the embodiment of the Antichrist, the devil is trying to replicate the glory of Babylon, the power of the Persians, and the swiftness of the Greeks. But yet he has it all mixed up. Now, go back with me uh, to Revelation chapter 13. Just an interesting cross-reference and a corollary scripture here. Interesting, why would the Antichrist choose those things? Because he's trying to replicate what God has already done. Now, we notice, the fifth thing we notice here in uh, Revelation is we notice his power. We've looked at his description. Now we notice his power. At the end of verse 2, it says this, and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. Now, it's interesting. If you're taking notes, you can write this down in Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4 in verses 8 through 10, the devil takes Jesus into a very high mountain. And the Bible tells us that the devil showed Jesus all of the kingdoms of the world and all their glory. And he said, listen, I'll give you all of these things if you'll fall down and worship me. And Jesus said, get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Now, listen, you know what Jesus didn't do? Is Jesus didn't say, that's not yours. You don't have that, it's not yours to give. Jesus never corrected him. Jesus never reproved him. Jesus never discounted what the devil had stated. Now, the devil was trying to get Jesus to do something that was both immoral and and completely unthinkable, to give the devil the place of God and God alone. And by the way, Jesus wouldn't give the devil God's place, and you and I shouldn't either. Amen? Now, listen, the devil said, hey, all the kings in the world are mine to give to whomever I want. Jesus never reproved him. Now, 
as the Antichrist, the false Christ, rises up, the devil gives him this power and this authority. The Scriptures reveal that in all areas, if you were to take a study, and by the way, we won't take an exhaustive study, but if you were to take a study through the Scriptures of this Antichrist, the first thing you're going to find out is this. He's known by many different names. Right here in Revelation 13, he's called the beast. He is a destroying beast. In 1 John 2, he is the Antichrist, the opposite of Christ. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, he's given three names, the man of sin, the son of perdition, meaning this, that he will go into destruction, and he's also called the little one. Back in Daniel chapter 7, he's known as the little horn. You'll find that as you study the Antichrist, uh, that he's known by many different names in the Bible. You will also find out that he is an amazing, uh, he is the embodiment of everything the world is looking for. My friend, if you're wondering why the world seems to be unraveling, if you wonder why order and decency and it, it seems to be slipping away and chaos is, is reigning around the world because the devil is aligning up the pieces all globally, listen, so that one man will ascend from the sea of the human population, listen, and this man will have the most amazing skills and abilities. The world will flock and yield their allegiance to him. He will distinguish himself, listen, intellectually. The Bible says that this man of the devil, the Antichrist, will be an intellect far superior than any others. He will distinguish himself orally. His speaking will be like none other. Politically, he will show himself to be a master politician. He will be a commercial and business genius, raising up uh, of finances like none before him. Militarily, he will be an unopposed conqueror. And religiously, he will be worshipped as God himself. He will single-handedly, with the power of the devil, unite the world, both religiously, politically, and religiously. Did I say that right? Uh, I said uh, commercially, politically, and religiously. It is coming together. Now, we notice something else here back in Revelation chapter 13. So we need, we've seen here his description. We've seen his power. I want you to notice in verse 3, his imitation. Look at verse 3. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death. And his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wandered after the beast. My friend, Jesus said this in John chapter 5 and verse 43. He says, I am come in my Father's name, and you receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him ye shall receive. Now, it is interesting. There is a multitude of scriptures. If you want to take down one reference, Isaiah chapter 52. In Isaiah 52, it is plainly prophesied that the Christ, the Messiah, will be wounded. In fact, he will be grievously sore wounded, and in fact, wounded unto death. And indeed, Jesus was. The Lord Jesus, who is the Christ, the Messiah, he was, uh, he was crucified for our sins. He was uh, uh, brutalized for our iniquities. He was crushed under the judgment of God for my sins and your sins, my friends. And that is what the book of Isaiah is talking about. But listen, the devil is seeking to imitate Christ. The devil knows that the Scriptures plainly pro uh, pro prophesy that the Messiah will be wounded, yet, yet miraculously live. And that is exactly what the devil does here. In Revelation 13, verse 3, we see that there is some sort of uh, offense or attack against him. He is wounded to a wound that should by no means be recovered, and yet he miraculously recovers under the power of the devil. Notice here in verse 5, the next thing we notice about the Antichrist is his mouth. Or his speaking. And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And blasphemies is speaking out of turn or speaking uh, things that are not true against others. Speaking blasphemies. Who is he blaspheming? And power was given unto him, continue 40 and two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against, uh, bla in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell therein. My friend, the devil has everything bad to say about God and about God's people and everything good to say about himself. Now listen, if you study, as you study out the Antichrist, you'll find out, listen, 
in all points, he is exactly opposite of Jesus. Jesus is from above. The Antichrist is from beneath. In fact, in Revelation 11, it says that he comes from the pit. Jesus' authority came from God the Father. The Antichrist's authority is from the devil. Jesus humbled himself, even under the death of the cross, while the Antichrist will pursue a career of nothing but self-exaltation. The, Jesus was rejected and crucified, but the Antichrist will be worshipped. In fact, we read that here. The Bible says, look in verse 12. Uh, I'm sorry, um, back up here in verse, um, in verse 7. It was given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him to over kindreds and tongues and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the Lamb's book of life, slain from the foundation of of the world. My friend, but listen, listen, the devil and his antichrist will come to an end. I close with this. God gives us, even here in Revelation chapter 13, as we see his power, we see his prestige, we see his, uh, his uh, imitation of Christ, yet in verse 10, in verse 10, God gives both us now hope, and he also gives those saints which are living during the tribulation encouragement. He that leadeth into captivity shall be led into captivity. That is talking about the Antichrist. As the Antichrist will take captive Jew after Jew, Christian after Christian, he himself will go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. The devil and the Antichrist will have the bloodiest reign in known in all of history. But listen, God says this, listen, just as the Antichrist will, will reign through destruction, he will be destroyed through destruction. Notice this little phrase, here is the patience and the faith of the saints. My friend, listen, yes, it looks very bleak in our world today. As you look at your children, you look at your grandchildren and great-grandchildren, you say, my friends, my soul, what hope do they have? My friend, listen, there is hope with God. God is not lost, neither is the battle, neither is the kingdom. Listen, God has a plan and a purpose, and it is coming together. Now, notice with me here his destruction. If you'll turn over with me to Revelation chapter 19, what will become of this devil-empowered man of sin? In Revelation chapter 19, we see the glorious conclusion of the tribulation time. Notice here, I want to get the the context here, in verse 11, in verse 11, and I saw heaven opened. Oh, my friend, that's going to be a great day. And a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness doth he judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but himself. He was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, and with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his, uh, 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 on his thigh a name written, the King of Kings, and Lord of Lords. Now notice with me in verse 19, what does this Jesus do when he comes back? And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken and with him the false prophet, we'll learn about him next week, that wrought miracles before him, and which uh, he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat on the horse, which sword proceedeth out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. My friend, listen, the very best the very greatest, the embodiment and the empowerment of the devil himself, my friend, will fall into certain, sure, and eternal judgment of God. At the return of Christ, at his glorious appearing, listen, my friend, there you notice here, 
there's no battle with the Antichrist. Oh, there is a battle that will ensue, but listen, my friend, at the return of the glorious Christ, the Antichrist falls in fast, swift, utter defeat. There is no war. There is no conflict. He falls, and he's banished along with the false prophet, listen, to the eternal lake of fire. My friend, listen to me. God wins. What's the end of the story, preacher? God wins. Is it a hard game? Yes, it is. Is it going to be an ugly period? Yes, it is. But listen, what's the end of the story? God wins. Amen? Let's close. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord. Father, we thank you, Lord, that the very embodiment of the devil himself is no match and is no opposition to the glorious Savior and the wonderful God who is our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray for our world. Oh, God. Lord, we think of the hundreds and millions and billions of people that will fall under the seducing spell of this man of sin. Oh, God, for the sheer purpose of leading their souls to an eternal destruction. Father, we weep for that. God, we mourn for that. God, we pray and we ask, oh, God, that you would help us. Lord, as we seek to launch forth this week into a week of witnessing, to a week purposed of outreach into the greater community of West Michigan, God, I pray, Lord, it is for the purpose of reaching ever-living souls with the good news and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that people would be saved this week before it is eternally too late. Heavenly Father, we pray and ask if there be one here this evening that is not absolutely certain of their eternal state, Lord, I pray. God, I pray, dear Lord, that the terror of the Lord would persuade them. Lord, that hell certainly awaits them. And God, I pray and I ask, oh God, that you'd help them to turn to you, Lord, with faith and repentance today. Heavenly Father, I pray, Lord, as we look upon our world, God, help us to do so through the eyes and the mind of Christ. Understanding, Lord, that there is, Father, a tumultuous period between now and the end of the culmination of your great plan. But Lord, thank you that you win and the devil loses. Bless this time of invitation in Jesus' name. Amen. If we'll stand to our feet tonight and uh, as we sing, a, I'm sorry, as the musicians uh, lead us in a verse of